Welcome to SLP Nerdcast. I'm Kate. And I'm Amy, and we appreciate you tuning in. In our podcast, we review and provide commentary on resources, literature, and we discuss issues related to the field of speech language pathology. You can use this podcast for ASHA CEUs. Visit our website for other courses, including live courses, webinars, blog posts, and SLP masterclasses available for graduate level credit. SLP Nerdcast is committed to improving continuing education in our field through affordable pricing and open access libraries. You can support our work by leaving a review, referring a friend, making a one-time contribution on our website, or subscribing. You can subscribe for as low as $7 a month and get access to monthly Q&A sessions, exclusive content, discounts, and a resource library of downloads, freebies, and printables. Want unlimited access to ASHA CEU courses? There's an affordable subscription for that too. For more information, visit us on our website or contact us anytime on Facebook, Instagram, or at info at slpnerdcast.com. We love hearing from our listeners and we can't wait to connect with you. And just a quick disclaimer, the contents of this episode are not meant to replace clinical advice. SLP Nerdcast, its hosts and guests do not represent or endorse specific products or procedures mentioned during our episodes unless otherwise stated. We are not PhDs, but we do research our material. We do our best to provide a thorough review and a fair representation of each topic that we tackle. That being said, it's always likely that there's an article that we've missed or another perspective that we haven't shared. If you have something to add to the conversation, please email us. We love hearing from our listeners. Welcome, everybody. Today, we are so excited for our guest. We've had multiple conversations leading up to today's episode, and she's been incredibly flexible, and she has so much to share. Welcome, Kelly Vess. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. This will be an amazing talk. Thanks for having me. We're so happy to have you. And you're here today to discuss selecting treatment targets to achieve optimal gain in treating phonological disorders. But before we get started, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Yes, I have a, close to 20 years of experience as a preschool speech language pathologist. And all along the way, I've been a researcher as well. So I research every detail of my practice to be as efficient as possible. So you, you can always find me at ASHA every year showing the latest research on what really makes a difference in your practice if you really want to get optimal outcomes. So that's something I'm extremely passionate about, which is why I'm so excited to be here today, because what we're going to talk about today is what I found to make, to have the greatest impact on outcomes in treating speech sound disorders. So I'm so excited to share this. It's going to be such a game changer for your listeners. That sounds like a, like something I can't wait to get into and, mm -hmm. and a little over my head already, which is great because it means I'm going to learn something. Um, okay. Tell us a little bit about your background and, and, and what you do. Mm -hmm. I'm, aside from being a speech pathologist, I'm also an author. I, I've written a book on uh, speech sound disorders and how to treat the whole child with speech sound disorders. Because we know that if a child has a speech sound disorder, the child is at greater risk for literacy impairments, at greater risk for behavioral issues, at greater risk for language issues, and at greater risk for academic failure. So the book in treating speech sound disorders is not about treating a speech sound disorder. I'm passionate about treating the whole child and creating lifelong change. So that is my passion. I'm also a clinical supervisor. So year round, I do research with graduate students and I teach graduate students how to treat speech sound disorders with preschoolers. That sounds so interesting. I love working with graduate students. It's such mm -hmm. a fulfilling experience. I'm sure you feel the same way. Mm -hmm. What I love about it is we always ask, how can we do this better? So we're always saying, okay, this is good. This is great practice. This is best practice even. Can we make it better? And I think that that's what's so neat about when you get a mastermind together, you get graduate students, you get yourself together, and then you come together and you create this third mind that's bigger than either of you combined. You create another mind that's even greater. So I love working with graduate school students. We're always innovating and we're always creating better. And that's why I'm so excited to be here because your listeners bring this unique skill set, this unique talent, this new unique secret sauce to the table. And when they have new techniques that they add to that, they're going to innovate whatever I share with you today and make it even better. 
you've already complimented so many people and you've only been here for just a few <laughs> minutes. So this is already, I'm feeling very positive and excited and energized. So that's awesome. Well, before we get into all the good stuff, the powers that be, i.e. Asha, makes me read all of our learning objectives and financial and non-financial disclosures. So I'm going to go ahead and read through those and get them out of the way so that we can get onto the good stuff. So first and foremost, learning objectives. Learning objective number one, participants will be able to select cluster treatment targets based on multiple phonological processes present to improve efficiency of treatment. Learning objective number two, participants will be able to assess how stimulable treatment targets are to accurate production provided multimodal cueing. And learning objective number three, participants will be able to make informed clinical judgments in selecting treatment targets based on phonological processes, variability of production, stimulability for accuracy, and developmental complexity. Disclosures, Kelly Vest Financial Disclosures. Kelly is the author of Speech Sound Disorders, Comprehensive Evaluation and Treatment, for which she receives royalties. Kelly Vest Non-Financial Disclosures. Kelly is a member of ASHA Special Interest Group 1, Language Learning and Education. Kate Grandbois Financial Disclosures, that's me. I am the owner and founder of Grandbois Therapy and Consulting, LLC, and co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. My non-financial disclosures, I'm a member of ASHA SIG 12 and serve on the AAC Advisory Group for Massachusetts Advocates for Children. I'm also a member of the Berkshire Association for Behavior Analysis and Therapy, Mass ABA, the Association for Behavior Analysis International, and the Corresponding Speech Pathology and Applied Behavior Analysis Special Interest Group. Amy, that's me. My financial disclosures are that I am an employee of a public school system and I receive compensation as co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. And my non-financial disclosures are that I am a member of ASHA, Special Interest Group 12, and I serve on the AAC Advisory Group for Massachusetts Advocates for Children. All right, we've done it. We've gotten through the boring bits and now on to the good stuff. Kelly, why don't you start off by giving us and our listeners just like a little refresher. Can you tell us a little bit about phonological disorders specifically? Okay, excellent. The phonological disorders are when we're looking at immature speaking patterns that are persisting beyond developmental age. So for instance, maybe the child is still deleting the final consonant of sounds. So that's fine when the child's two years old and the child points to a dog and says, da. But when the child is three years old and the child continues to delete the final consonant, still has that immature speaking pattern, then it becomes a phonological processing disorder. It's persisting beyond the age it's expected. So the child is still saying, da, for dog. And when we see that, we know that this child is not, that there's something about the linguistic system that's not well developed. They don't seem to understand that a word has a beginning, middle, and end. Another example of a phonological processing dis, uh, that, that disorder uh, example that you're going to see very commonly is a child fronting a sound. So if the child looks at the cat, instead of saying cat, the child's going to say tat because pulling the tongue back and retracting the tongue is difficult for the child. So now the child's four years old and at four years old, that's persisting beyond age expectation. So for that reason, we're going to say this child has is likely has a phonological processing disorder. These simplified speaking patterns, which were okay to do when you're younger, are not being suppressed and they're not developing into more mature speech. So that's what we're looking at when we're looking at in preschool is phonological processing disorder. They're doing things beyond age expectation that they should have suppressed and they should have developed a more mature speaking form. So thank you so much for that refresher, because as our listeners know, I don't know very much about these kinds of things. I've been working in the world of AAC for entirely too long. And as a matter of fact, this is Amy's area. She, you know, so much more about this than me, Amy. With, with so many other things too. But I really appreciate sort of setting the groundwork and setting the stage for what we're going to talk about today and, and giving us that refresher. And I have to assume then that everything we're going to be talking about today from a treatment perspective is very much related to these linguistic foundations and as, and differs from a different kind of speech uh, uh, intervention approach, for example, for something that's motor related. Is that an accurate assumption? 
Mm -hmm. What we're going to focus on today is classes of sounds. For instance, in phonological processing disorder, if a child is stopping fricatives, the child is producing the P for F, P and B for F and V. The child is producing T and D for S and Z. The child is producing probably T and D for SH and JA. So we have a lot, or for TH, the child is producing, uh, I'm sorry, P or B perhaps. So we have a whole class of sounds that are impacted. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to focus on the rule. We're not going to want to focus on six different sounds and take a chisel to that rock. What we're going to learn today is we're going to learn how to treat that phonological processing disorder, treat that rule and take fireworks to that rock and explode that rock. And that's how Lynn Williams, the president of ASHA describes it. When we use the complexity approach, which we're talking about today, we're not taking a chisel to that rock, to those six sounds. We're gonna take a fireworks to that rock, explode that rock, and change the child's linguistic system by using the most complex sounds and sound combinations. That's what's so exciting about it. This is not the, uh, I think of Charlie and the Chocolate Factor, oomfa, oomfa, oomfaity, to, uh, do approach in which you're doing one sound at a time, one by one, slow, slow, slow. Instead, it's an explosion that will literally change a child's linguistic system very, very quickly and uh, impact all sounds simultaneously. Can I ask a question just to, mm -hmm. to say it back to you or make sure I've understood yes, it? So yeah. the complexity approach is a specific approach that where you're treating a rule or a cluster or a group of phonological presentations mm -hmm. instead of treating one thing at a time. Is that an accurate description of the complexity approach? Because I've never heard of it before, just straight up. Yes. Yeah, the complexity approach, exactly. The complexity approach says, okay, the speech speech develops like a waterfall. And if we go and, and if we go into those clusters, which are the last things to develop in our language, SKR, it develops at seven years of age. That's the very last cluster in our language. Let's go to the top of our mountain, the most complex sound and work at that level. And then we're going to improve that level and there's gonna be a waterfall effect in which all of the sounds below it are going to spontaneously improve. That's what's neat about it. That's how speech develops. It doesn't work like a geyser. If I work on the earliest developing sounds, if I work on the, the simplest sounds, the P, the B, the M, I only help P, B, and M. It, I don't improve the later developing sounds. Its speech doesn't work like a geyser in which it shoots up. It works like a waterfall in which it cascades down. So I care less about P, B, M, T, D, and the earliest developing sounds because they're not gonna impact the later ones. I care about the later developing sounds because if I work on these sounds, the earlier developing sounds are gonna spontaneously develop. And that's what Lynn Williams was talking about when she said you're bringing, putting a firecracker to the rock. You're blowing the rock up and improving all of these sounds underneath by working on the most difficult sounds. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. For instance, if I work on the SKR blend, I'm going to work on stopping of fricatives. I'm going to work on fronting of velar sounds, K and G, the T and D. I'm going to work on gliding of L and R. So I'm going to get three phonological processes that are very common to preschoolers all at the same time. Three for the price of one. And what matters, why that matters so much is because we only have 30 to 60 minutes a week to make a difference. So we have to challenge creates change. Status quo does not. So I look at the brain like the body. If you only have 30 to 60 minutes a week to work out, you can make a difference, but you're going to have to be challenged in order to make a difference. You're not going to do it taking a walk 30 to 60 minutes a week. You're going to do it by doing something challenging, let's say burpees, a full body anaerobic activity that tests your strength and all your muscles as well. 
where you get three for the price of one. You're working it might out. make you cry afterwards. Yeah, may everybody make hates burpees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But what are you doing? You're working multiple sounds at once. You're working multiple muscle groups at once. You're using your time efficiently and you're challenging because challenge creates change. Status quo doesn't. The children I work with, when they come to me, they're at the one percentile. They're at the standard score 50. They have severe speech impairment due to phonological processes. By the end of the school year, on average, they're in the normal range. They're in the 50 percentile. They have a hundred standard score. And that's because I'm challenge creates change. I'm at the top of the mountain. I'm working on SKR with these kiddos. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And the waterfall, all that other stuff is spontaneously developing. The ends of the words that they're dropping. I don't focus my time on that. That's gonna spontaneously develop. So that, that's what we're going to talk about today and why it's so exciting is that you're going to create, you're, these children are going to take a 180 because we're going to work smarter and not harder and it's in the treatment target. The treatment target matters a lot. Oh, I was, so I was just going to say, tell us more, tell us what to do. What, how do you do this? Okay, this is great. So the first thing we're going to do, step one, we're going to do the speech sound disorder test, the single word test. And we know there isn't a lot of reliability that, but we need to find out what are we going to work on? So what are we going to focus on? Those phonological processes. We don't care about the sounds. We care about the rules. What is this child doing? Okay, this child is stopping. They're stopping all fricatives. Okay, we need to pick what sound we're going to pick an S blend. Why? because S is complex. So we, and S is also highly frequent. So let's work on something high and complex. S, oh, they're also fronting. Okay, they're fronting the sounds. Are we gonna work on K, G, and ing? No, let's go on for K. So we'll go S, K. Oh, they're gliding L and R. Okay, let's throw R in there. S, K, R will be the blend that we work on. Three for the price of one. Am I gonna work on syllable deletion? No. Am I gonna work on final consonant deletion? No, because that is gonna naturally develop. I'm gonna work on the top of the mountain, not on the bottom of the mountain. That's how it's gonna roll. But let's, so that's what the starting point. The starting point is go to the top of the mountain. And you're probably wondering, well, what if the child can't do SKR blends? What if the child says, you know, you say, okay, say scrape, and the child says tape, then what do you do? What we're gonna do is we are gonna empty out our toolbox. We're gonna give them every cue at once because we don't care what the child can do. That's status quo. We care about what the child could do. That's dynamic assessment. So we're going to, what kind of cues are we gonna give them? Everything, everything under the sun. If it's in your toolbox, give them everything and see what they're capable of. So for instance, when it comes to the cueing, here are the cues I'm gonna give them to check and see what are you capable of? Because that's what I care about. I don't care what you can do on your own. We're agents of change, okay? We, we're not testers, we're changers. We're changing these children. So I'm gonna say, all right, what would happen if I give you slowed unison speech and I give you what's called a temporal cue, which means I show it to you spatially. So if I'm making a snake sound, I'm gonna make a snake with my finger and I'm gonna do it really, really slowly and hold it up so you can hear it and you can join me. And why don't I, maybe you have to even, maybe you're gonna hold, this is a touch cue, your, your mouth back and retract your, retract your lips. Maybe you have to hold your, your lips in a smile form to make that, that S sound. And maybe I have to say a little visual imagery. Okay, let's make the snake sound. I'm going to give you every cue in my toolbox and see if you can do it. And suppose, for instance, the child says, with everything you give them, with the angry dog teeth, you say, okay, let's make the angry dog R sound. Or they say, squape. Now you're asking a good question. What are you gonna do then? We don't wanna reinforce W for R. We don't want to cement that because practice makes perfect, but practice also makes imperfect. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna still go for three clusters. We're gonna say, let's do SQU blends. 
How about I squash it to you instead? We'll talk about that later because three clusters, we put three sounds together is more powerful than two. You're gonna get bigger gains with three. That's what our research has found. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. So the second thing we're gonna do is we're going to, first we're gonna pick the top of the mountain sound that the child can produce if we give them every cue imaginable. And that's our starting point. So then what do we do after that, right? Suppose the child is like, can't produce the R. So you say, they say rake, they say wake. You give them angry dog, they rake. And they still say wake. What can we do then? We're going to say location, location, location. Just like real estate, we need better neighbors. So we're gonna find neighboring sounds that can help them produce the R. So what sounds can we put before the letter R that gets them retracting that li those lips? So if we want a sound where they're going to retract the lips, so they're going, it's going to make R easier for them. I feel them. like I should know the answer. I don't know the answer. Amy, do you know so the answer? Let's think of a consonant that will retract the lips. Amy, what's your answer? I don't want to answer. <laughs> I mean, I think anything <laughs> thinking about like, yes. oh, yeah. there you go. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So what are we going to do? This really, really works since we're going to say, all right, all right. Okay. You can't, you're doing W for R. Let's give you the G or the K blend. So let's say the word instead of, we're going to say like, let's, for instance, let's grind it to me, please. If you're going to say that grind it, or maybe we're going to say a cut, let's, can you clean it? I mean, are we doing cr crank it to me, please? So when you do the K and the G, those are location, location, location. I love that acronym. That's very yeah. easy to remember. Yeah. So I, I want to say all of this back to you to make yes. sure that I understand what you're saying. Yes. And I think that what you're saying, it's okay to say I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that what you're saying is that the first thing a clinician wants to do when they're thinking about the target, because the target is so important. The first thing the clinician needs to do is get a feel for what the child is already producing. So identify those processes that might be in place, whether they're stopping, final consonant deletion, whatever. And then you're really doing, like you just described in so many really nice ways, you're doing this dynamic assessment. And so you're giving all of your clinician cues and seeing what is the child stimulable for? If I use dynamic assessment and try all of these different types of cues, what cues work? And are there things that still the, the child isn't stimulable for, even if I give all of my clinician cues? So then if those cues don't work, then we need to, as clinicians, put on our speech pathology hats and think about what we know about place, manner, and voicing and think about what are some other like sound friends that we can put mm -hmm. next to the target so cute. Um, to help facilitate that production. Is that, is that a fair restatement? Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Exactly. I love that you said, first, what are the rules? Let's crash those rules. Second, you said, okay, I'm going to empty my toolbox on you. And then third, if that's not working, okay, I need some help. I need some neighbors. What would be good neighbors to help me if, to get that sound? I love it. So for R, because R is so difficult, some other sounds that are really good are TR or DR blends. Because TR blend is actually the African sh. So once again, you can't round your lips when you do cha. You protrude them, train. So, and then you have the word drop. So those are great blends to break the W for R. I like to work on the W for R early because that's a sound that persists into adulthood. Many of us know adults where it's habituated and, the, and by kindergarten, I almost find it to be too late where it's habituated often too much and it's very difficult to change because they've said W for R a million times before. But yes, thank you. That is awesome, Amy. I love you. Good job, Amy. Good yeah. examples. No, those, that was great. great. I was, all right, thumbs up. I got it right. I got it right. You, I'll here. tell you, it's great because what happens during these evaluations is the parent, not only does the child believe in you, like, whoa, 
I can do these things. It's very empowering when you when you when you bring out all and show them what they're capable of. The parent buys in as well. This is what makes us different than Joe Schmo off the street. When they say tat, and, and, and the person says say cat, and they say tat, okay, game over. That's not like us. We're at game on. So yeah, thank you so much for that wonderful summarization of one, two, three. It's as, as simple as that. I have a question that's related to something you said a few minutes ago. So you'll have to forgive me if this is slightly tangential, but you said something about what the research says. And I wondered if for those um, SLPs who are listening, who maybe aren't as familiar with this approach or are interested in applying this approach, does the research say anything about what profile of client this is best matched for? In other words, who is represented? What students or clients are represented in this research? Well, uh, the research shows that the children that with severe, severe impairment really benefit from this approach. So children that have, have like don't have hardly any sounds developed because by working on these more complex sounds, you're going to develop a lot of sounds. And I think it's a really important question that you ask because when you're using this approach, when these kids come to me in the one percentile, they make huge gains initially because they're getting pop, P, B, T, D, N, K. They're getting those F, B, those really simple sounds. And then it's like mountain biking and you get to the top. When you get to the R and the L and the blends, you get off the bike. And those are more complex sounds. They're more difficult, whatever approach you're using. And you're walking really, really slowly. I do use this approach personally with all of the preschoolers on my caseload and even the children that just have problems with our distortions, because I found in my work that you have to work over what your goal is. When you're in speech therapy, you have to overtrain. You have to work at a higher level for it to generalize outside of that room. So I've done research on R. I work on the word scrape, S-K-R, and then they make benefit on R that way in the singleton position because I work on it at a harder level. And it's funny because all of these elementary speech pathologists are like, they email me, I've been working on R for like three years with this child. And then I started working on SKR with them and they're getting it in like two months. And that's because you're working at a higher level. And that's the way it works, it cascades down. What you do in speech doesn't geyser up. And what you do in speech, I find, doesn't even move to the side. You've got to work at a higher level than the real world that you expect to happen. This makes a lot of sense. I mean, even though it's slightly above my pay grade, but I, I really appreciate the visuals that you're using and the the acronyms and things. I think that that makes that makes it feel doable and applicable. And I'll tell you what my, what my research has also found, which is like, if I want to improve two element blends, like S blends to element, the word like slide, I need to work at a higher level in speech therapy. I need to work on a word like splash, a three element word in speech therapy for the child to be able to do it on testing and for the child to be able to do it in the real world. So that, that's what, what I've found. And that's the way it works. You've got to go over it. Whatever your goals are for the child to accomplish with no cues, you need to work over it with cues in speech and then fade them out. So when we think about, sorry, jumping in, um, just looking at our learning objectives and that second learning objective and thinking about stimulability, we talked a little bit about stimulability. And if you try, you know, using your intervention approaches and the, and the child still isn't stimulable, just like you said, we don't want to keep having this repeated practice of an error pattern. That's not what we yeah. want. We don't want to yeah. be learning an incorrect production. Yes. Um, so we've talked about stimulability. In, in the context of clinician cues and also, you know, kind of setting up those, I don't know, I'm going to call them sound friends, but sort of facilitating <laughs> the context for your, for your target production. Can you talk to us a little bit just about some more of that multimodal cueing that you're using? And just, you already gave us some really nice examples of that, mm -hmm. um, but maybe helping our listeners think a little bit more about what how you might sort through that stimulability piece a little bit. If you have a student who's maybe not stimulable with your cues, maybe they're not stimulable with the facilitative cues and how you might change your cueing a little bit um, 
for those kiddos. Awesome. Like there's some that like, for instance, I work with three-year-olds. There's some, some three-year-olds that can't produce K and G. They cannot do it. And the reason for that is protracting and retracting the tongue is really, really hard. And they simply don't have that neuromuscular developed yet. And I'm not going to, there was a child, I'm going to tell you a story just to cement what we're saying, which the only word she could say G in, she could not front in, is saying the word ugly. <laughs> I tried every keyword out there. And why is that? Because I had awe. And I had Lee. So she would say, that's not ugly. I want it, please. And the mom thought it was bizarre. But the next week we were working on, can you scrape it to me, please? Because I have a cool girl teeth. But you have to start somewhere. Okay, but what about the child that can't do K and G? What do we do then? Because they just can't. We work on L and R. And that's because L and R are neighbors right next door. They're that palatal sound right there. And do you know what happens when I work on L and R? When the child turns four and a half, typically K and G will naturally develop. That's what I'm finding. I have found one child in the last 10 years where it persisted the K and G. And it was a lot of elbow grease at four and a half years too, but only one out of probably a hundred. But that's a great question. Some children, it's just, it's not there yet. And you're going to have to shelf it. And you're going to, but what I did when we work on L and R, that's more complex. And it's nice when K and G naturally develops because K and G can bring children to tears holding their tongue down with a tongue depressor, putting a cherry on their teeth, all of this lying on their back and writing on a table and looking in a mirror. Just stop. <laughs> I mean, they, it just stop. They're not ready for it yet. So, but thank you. That's a really great question. And I think another thing is we're going to get into it in a moment, which is really important is, is all of the cues and how do you remove those cues? Because that's super, super important. You give them everything in the toolbox. Now, how do you take tools away? So I think we can go to that. And this is very important. What yes, please. Want, should we go to that? Yes, okay. please. So we're going to go. We're giving, I'm going to give you an example, the word scrape, which is the hardest to use in the language, a language in our language. And I'm going to, you're going to hear it auditorily, but I want to give you an example of what it sounds like a unison speech really slowly going every sound. And then I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna take away and we're gonna go through the steps. So I'm gonna be using my body. And when I use my body and fingers, these are cues, sure, I've been trained in prompt. I have no Kaufman. I know easy does it for praxia. I know all of these cues out there. I create my own and so do my graduate students based on what makes sense to me. And it's been highly effective. So what, what I think my rattlesnake looks different than someone else's cobra. Everyone has a different cue that they use depending on what feels right to them. So I'm just gonna show you the SKR. I'm just going to show you how we do that. It would be like this. And I'll yell out, I'm sorry, snake sound. Let me hear your snake sound. Oh, it's so loud, what a loud snake sound. And for people who can't see, Kelly is doing these beautiful uh -huh. hand motions with like a viper fingers and like swirly snake movements. So this is definitely a, a, a very uh, immersed experience. Yes, thank, thank you. And I liked it. I learned this from Lynn Williams back in 2008 when she came to Misha. She was like, this is a snake. And the snake was going all over her body. Now the child can perceive the snake sound. So I always tell my graduate students, pretend you're at a Taylor Swift concert and you're in the back row balcony seat. So you need to use those gestures so big, bigger is better. And, and so loud. And, and so they really break in through this, the static. Okay, so we're doing that snake sound. And then I'm going to take my finger. I'm not putting it in my mouth, but I'm going to kind of make it incompatible. Ka. So they're going to do that too. And then we say, angry, so angry dog teeth, once again, I'm holding on to until they can join me. I'm giving them time to perceive it. And I'm not going to take, Whoa. I'm like, oh no, that's weak. You know, that's a fish. Uh, uh Waiting for it to come out right. Okay, so that's maximum prompt. It's unison. Da, da, da. First thing to take out is auditory. Remove the auditory as soon as possible. 
So you're saying, so I'm not going to start, I'm going to stop talking as soon as possible. And why is that? Because auditory prompts are the hardest to fade. Children become dependent on auditory prompts. And there is, besides that, I want the child to be the teacher. I want to develop an internal locus of control. So I'm going to use the word scrape and no other word. I'm not going to say screw, screen, scrape, scratch. No, screech. Because if I'm doing that, then I'm in control. And not only am I in control, the child's focusing on what to say and not how to speak. So I'm only going to say the word scrape. That's the only word I'm going to say all year. And there's research behind that that says one exemplar, just one, is better than many. And this is why is because the child can master it and the child can say, I don't care about the word. I care about how I talk. Am I making a snake sound? Is the tongue in the back of my mouth? Do I have angry dog teeth? That's what's going on in the child's head. So we're doing toolbox. The first tool I take away is speech. And I'm only miming. I'm miming with the child with my mouth. Will I jump in with an angry dog teeth if, to help out with the hard sounds? Yeah. So maybe the word is scrape because I know the child has a little bit of problems with the W for R. But the first step is get rid of the auditory cue and give everything else to the child. And since this is an auditory modality, just again, for the sake of saying it for our listeners, you are gesturing so emphatically. So when you're saying angry dog teeth, you're your lips are retracted, your teeth are bared, you're, you've got your hands up like little paws. I mean, this is a this is a very immersed experience. So as you're describing removing different environmental cues and removing the speech, there is still a lot else. There's a lot going on for the mm -hmm. child sitting across from you because you are really immersed in this multimodal cueing system. And that's extremely important. Thank you for bringing it up because I tell the interns, you have to be like a cheerleader because you're like, give me an S, you know? And if you're just like, hmm, you know, that really helps. No, it's a big, it's just like you, if you're giving letters to a sound and you're doing a cheer, except the child's right next to you. <laughs> but it really works because all of the energy that you're expelling too is really motivating to the child. And you know what is the most motivating to the child? You're the teacher now. I'm the student. I didn't even say a word. And, that, and I think that is the ultimate goal of therapy is internal locus of control. The child is in charge of the learning. The child has taken ownership. And that to me is the golden apple. If we've taught children, children learn that my efforts matter, that what I can be successful if I work hard, that's the best thing we can teach children with communication impairments. And it's interesting because the research, James Law did meta and analytical research uh, he is an amazing researcher of these children with communication impairments in kindergarten. And when they're 32 years old, they're more likely to have an external locus of control, meaning they don't think they have control over their lives. They don't think they have control over their professional lives. They're less likely to think they have control over their personal lives, their personal success. They think it's outside of their control. But we can change their lives early on by letting them know you're the teacher, you're in control, I'm the student. Wow. So, and that hard work matters. So, so once you remove the auditory cue, what's yeah. next? Are you, oh, you're I still your cheerleader, you're making yes. big movements, you're you know, really having a good time. It's party yeah. time central, but you're no yeah. longer providing an auditory cue. Yes. Then what do you do? I love, I love you're asking all the important questions. Don't drop the baby because the child needs to be 80%. And if we pull away too many tools from our toolbox and the child goes below 80%, we have two things that are going to happen. One, we're going to habituate errors or two, we're going to frustrate the child. We don't want that to happen. So we're always going to give enough tools and support, we might have to add more, whoa, I pulled back too much, sorry. 
or we might have to pull back. Okay, you're 90% accurate. This is too easy for you. I got to stay at 80% at all times. That's a magic number. So we're there at 80%. The next thing I might pull up is tactile. I don't touch the children. I have the children touch themselves because they're the teacher. So for instance, if we're doing the B sound, they put their hands over the hand, bah, like because or something like that. They will touch their own mouth. But, and I'll touch my own mouth. So the next cue is to get away from them touching themselves. And I think that's important because of COVID and because of illness. So they might hold their cheeks for the cha-cha sound. They might hold their cheeks down ch for the choo-choo sound. That we're gonna get away with now and we're gonna make it visual in the air. So I might choo-choo with my hands. So we're gonna get away from the child touching the child's own face to help produce the child sounds. So we took away the auditory first. The auditory, we always wanna get rid of that as soon as possible. Then we're gonna get away from the child touching the child's own face and using instead that what I call temporal cueing, which is what you're showing with your body and space, how to produce the sound, like the snake. It's continuous. The snake keeps going and going with the S sound. That's known as a temporal cue. I'm gonna hold on to those. I'm gonna hold on to my visual cue. So I might just make a snake. I'm not giving the temporal to show how to do it. I'm just putting a cobra so that they remember their snake sound. Or I might give an imagery cue, which I'm like, oh, I hear the snake sound, snake sound. Or I might yell out snake sound. So I'm going to first take out auditory, then take out touching, and then I'm but and then we're going to keep the temporal showing with our body how to cue. We're going to keep a visual and we're going to keep the imagery. And just for the sake of, again, describing what you're doing, you're making these hand motions yes. that are animal-like. So you're yeah. still providing, when you're talking about a temporal cue, you're talking about moving your body continually to show time. When you're mm -hmm. talking about a visual cue, you're still making bear paws or you're still yeah. making a little viper signal, which is, I've never really thought of making a little viper motion with my hand, your two little fingers up like fangs. I, I, I love the way that you're making this so multidimensional. That's mm -hmm. it, 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 I, it makes a lot of sense to remove the cueing in that order. Yeah. And that, and that's the thing, like learning, we learn best when it's multimodal, when both, I believe when the children too, when I show you the cues I'm doing, the children's child's doing the cues with me. The child's also making a snake with their body. The child's also, so this is very important. We learn best when we're using all of, when we're multi-expression, when the children are expressing themselves through their body and through their entire bodies. And when we're teaching using our entire bodies. Song as well. I didn't mention song, but, but we do the songs too. So afterwards, after we're done, we, I heard the snake sound, the snake sound, the snake sound. I heard the snake sound. I heard a lot. You know, I'll tell therapy with you sounds fun. Yeah, There's a lot of exciting yeah. things happening in your treatment room. Yeah, and fun is so important. I'm glad you brought that up. We don't talk enough about that. I think in therapy and speech pathology realm, there's tons of research for emergent learning. And that just shows that if children love learning, they're going to go on to learn more and become better at it. It's just like emergent reading. So I always, when I evaluate an activity with a graduate student, I always ask, well, well the number one question is, how fun is this? <laughs> I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. And I, I also think there's something to be said for the intersection of communication and joy yeah. and, and making sure that not only is it fun, but the individual that we're working with is experiencing some sort of joy while they are learning to communicate or they are experiencing joy through you know, as a result of their communication and, and, and especially that's so it's so important for even us as adults, but especially for, for young, young children who are struggling with a communication impairment of, of some sort. Oh yeah. How many children? It's so sad. I've seen so many three-year-olds, three-year-olds be like, I bring out a children's book and they're like, I'm not a good reader. And it's like, oh, but that's what, that's exactly what you're saying. It already, you know, or they close their mouth because they know I can't say that word. Like they already have like almost shame mm -hmm. associated with their speech or their literacy or their language skills at three years of age. So if we can change that, like you said, and make speech something joyful, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's huge. Absolutely. 
Okay. So you've walked us through this complexity approach and, you know, getting our biggest bang for our buck by targeting more complex sounds at the top of the mountain, as you said, Mm -hmm. and you've walked us through multimodal cueing and how to provide multimodal cueing and then fade multimodal cueing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about learning objective number three, Mm -hmm. um, specifically around selecting the treatment targets that you're working with based on the phonological patterns that you see. Yeah. I love that. So what you're talking about right now is really, really important. Uh, Before I go into that, I want to talk a little bit. I'm going to go right back to that because that's really important. Oh yeah, go for it. About how progress is going to be made. Because I think a lot of people are going to do the complexity approach and they're going to say, I've been working at SKR blends. Okay, Kelly, I've been working at SKR blends and there's 0%. Okay. (laughs) I've been working at all year. I've been working on the word scrape and there's 0%. This does not work. That's what I think they're going to say. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to get back to that. I want you to know that speech develops like teeth. Okay? So it, we can't change how speech develops. We're not going to make the molars. The molars come out. Right, first of all, how do, how do teeth develop? First, you have the front teeth. And then you have the lateral incisors teeth. And then after that, the, the canines. And then you're going to have the molars. And I don't care what your dentist does. That's how everyone's teeth are going to develop. Okay. All around the world and all the languages around the world, speech always develops the same way. So first you're going to have vowels, then you're going to have stops, then you're going to have fricatives, then you're going to have affricates, then you're going to have two element clusters, three element clusters, and liquids, those really hard liquids like L and R. Okay. Coming up, uh, up there at the top. So when you're working on three element blends, which are the top, the mountain, they're gonna develop last, okay? So when you do testing, what's gonna happen? I've been working on SKR blends. When I show a parent the test results, we're gonna see, oh, okay, I'm working on SKR blends. They've developed P, B, T, D, N, F, V, K, G, S, Sh, J, that none of these sounds I even touched. I didn't touch these sounds in any of these words. But those are going to spontaneously develop because of the waterfall effect. What are they going to struggle with? They're going to do multisyllabic words. They're going to do final consonants. What's going to be left for us to work on? Do you want to guess? What what is going to be still hard for the child that I'm working on SKR with? And what's left now that the child's struggling with? I have no idea. Amy. Okay. Yeah. Amy's gonna Amy's gonna Amy's gonna guess. I guess. can't guess. It's gonna be those later developing yeah. sounds and clusters. That I'm working on. So what is your child? Okay, your child, we're at the we're at the top of the mountain. We're walking right now. We're walking that bike and the mountain biking. And the child's gonna have problems with clusters. The child's probably gonna have problems with L and R. These late developing sounds are gonna be left, but that's what I've been working on all year. Well. Yeah, but we don't change how speech develops. The earlier sounds will always develop before the later sounds, but they're just going to develop faster. And I just explained to the students, we're just running up these stairs. Mm -hmm. So my question is related to, you know, in terms of thinking or talking to that SLP who has been working on these later developing sounds all year and and hasn't Mm. seen any progress, Mm -hmm. how would you recommend measuring progress in that scenario? Are you continually monitoring the development or probing for earlier development sounds to make sure that there is some some progress monitoring happening instead of just saying well we've worked on this one blend all year didn't happen oh well like how do you how do you measure progress along the way i love what you're asking because every 8 weeks i lo- i give a speech test a single word speech test and i see progress that way So, okay, the child starts with 80 errors on the test. Now, this is not uncommon. And three months later, there's 40 errors. And then three months later, now we only have 20 errors. But guess what those 20 errors are? The R, the L, because we're at the top of the hill now. But I explained to the parent how this is going to work. We're going to run up these stairs. Look at all of these early developing sounds that naturally developed. Look, your child's saying the ends of words now. Your child's saying all the syllables now. 
you know, this is working. But I, I explained to them also, okay, this is where we're now elbow grease time. At the end, things are going to slow down. But the, that's what I do is you're right. If I said, well, let's assess SKR. Oh, we're still 0%. We're still 0%. Now, I will tell you a population that does, it, that does not test well, I found is children with ADHD, uh, children with attentional deficits. When I put speech tests in front of them, they're like, man, man, man. <laughs> but I want to tell you, just rest assured with these children, because if you're doing in therapy, the 80% rule, they're 80% accuracy and accurate in therapy. The parents are 80% accurate at home. I find it takes them a year. And then a year later, it's like fireworks. They're going from one percentile to the 50 percentile normal as well. It just takes them a whole year for it to generalize to testing. They do not, I find a lot of them don't test well. Mm -hmm. But from an ethical standpoint, you're monitoring progress of your treatment throughout the course of your treatment through data collection and goal modification. If you're in a, you know, if you're not writing IEP goals, right. I mean, you're not just hanging your hat on the, well, we'll see what happens in a year peg because we can't do that as SLPs. I, I appreciate. And I think it's important to note the importance of uh, important to note the importance of, I think it's, I think it's valuable to make note that, it's critical for us to be probing for some of the, for the impacts of some of our treatment, even if it's not directly obvious for us in our treatment space. Yeah. And that's what, what I care about is the level of cueing. And they're always going to be 80%, 80% maximum level of prompt, 80% visual only level of prompt, 80% imagery only level, 80% no prompting. So I really, I'm, I'm my goal when I write goals, because I know people are like, what is your goal? My goal will look like this. The child will produce SKR with given a maximum level of prompting at 80% accuracy. The next goal, the child will produce SKR blends with 80% accuracy given a moderate level of prompting. The next goal, a minimum level of prompting. The next goal, no prompting. So, um, or maybe even just minimal would be where we left off. Mm -hmm. Do you ever write goals for earlier developing sounds, even though you're treating a more complex target? So for example, you are hoping to address improvements in an earlier developing phonological process like stopping, but you're working on these much higher developing blends. Do you ever write goals for something that you're not directly working on and then measure or probe for progress towards those earlier developing skills? Oh, I like that. Okay. I, I, I don't, but I really, as the woman who knows nothing about phonological yeah. disorders as a full disclosure. No, <laughs> I, I, I love it because I inherit my goals from early intervention and they write goals like the child was suppressed stopping, the child was suppressed fronting, the child was suppressed cluster reduction. And they write, those are milestone goals for me. So I am able to say achieved, achieved and usually cluster reduction they're gliding it typically that hasn't been achieved it's at the end those are the molars that come in last even though i've been working on that the whole time but yeah that's i like those you can definitely write your goals that way write your goals i i like to do skr because it's clear and what i'm doing every day in practice but if i did stopping gliding and uh fronting those are great those are great goals to write that equally assess them and, and maybe assess more the class that we're working on, the rule we're working on. If someone else were to pick it up and mm -hmm. say, hey, I, what am I doing? SKR, what? Yeah, so I love that. Amy, did you have a question? I was just thinking back about kind of this complexity approach and how it you know, can address these different types of phonological processes that we might see. And I guess I was wondering, are there ever times when you wouldn't look at a cluster, at, at producing a consonant cluster kind of as your treatment activity? Would that change if you had a student who presented with a specific profile of phonological processes or, you know, kind of what, what does that thought process look like back sort of thinking about those target selections? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. I'm going to be, this is what I do, and it really, really works for me. A lot of the children I work with are vowelizers. So they go, ah, ah, ah. And I show this in my book. Our step one is SW blends. And the reason for that is because S is long. So it gives them time to perceive it. An S is 150 milliseconds long, where if you look at PBTD, those stop sounds are only 30 milliseconds. So I want a sound that's long enough for them to perceive and join in on. And then the W is easy to produce. So it'd be like, I can draw it out. So I'd like to say the word sweep. So I'll say, so it's, it sounds like this. Ooh. I can hold ooh forever. I can hold s forever. So that gives the child time to join in with me in unison speech. And then, like I said, what happens when I work on SW blends is all of those earlier developing sounds naturally develop. I'm not wasting time working on P, B, T, D, N, those early sounds. It, they always naturally develop. I've never gone below SW ever. Uh, and that's what you're going to see in the book. You're going to see a lot of children that can't talk. And it, we show SW as our step one. And that's because we can use our body and give them more to perceive and more to join in on. Yeah. And that's making me think just back to way, way back in the time machine, but back to my grad school days and, and all of the, when we first learned transcription and thinking about place, manner and voicing and how important that is, you know, and, and just sometimes we have been trained to do sort of that more systematic approach and say like, okay, I'm going to work on things within this one class of, you know, manner, right? So thinking about stops as a class or thinking about continuance as a class. And so this complexity approach, if, I, if I'm if i getting it correctly, and it might not be, but um, would be kind of integrating what we already know as speech pathologists about place, manner, voicing, and just thinking about these more complex combinations of things that really aren't in the student system at the moment. And we're trying to work on that in hopes that it's going to, you know, result in this learning of other things rather than going sort of methodically through like, okay, I'm doing stops. Okay. I'm doing Africans. Okay. I'm doing transitions between, you know, a stop or something like that. Is that, I mean, that's, oh, that's sort of the big contrast, you. right? You brought up such an important topic to end on, which was maximally distinct sounds. How do we, yes, how do we do acrobats in the mouth? How do we do Cirque de Soleil in the mouth? Okay, we know that complex is better. Let's talk coordination. Okay, I love it. All right, so part of the complexity approach, that's super important. I'm glad you're bringing this up, but this is ending in a bang, is that we need what's known as maximally distinct sounds. So we have consonants, two types of consonants in our language. We have obstruents in which the airflow is obstructed and we have sonorants and sonorants, the airflow is glided along the tongue, like sonorous, okay. What we wanna do when we do clusters is we want to mix an obstruent with a sonorant and that is creating Cirque de Soleil in the mouth. You're going from zero, to 100 and you're improving motor coordination. And in doing that, you're going to improve syllable production. You're gonna improve final consonants. You're gonna improve blends. All of those things are gonna be improved. Those coordination issues, assimilation errors are gonna be improved. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna take a sound like an S blend. Are we going to say the word spoon? No because then we have a fricative and a stop. And that's an obstruent with an obstruent. They're two alike. That's not Cirque de Soleil in the mouth. We wanna take that S blend, S, and we wanna put it, like I said, with a W, which is a glide. 
So we're going obstruent to a sonorant sound, Cirque de Soleil in the mouth, major coordination difficulty, maximally distinct. And like Lynn Williams would say, that's when you take fireworks to the rock. You're challenging motor coordination. So why would we take SL? Why is SL such a great blend slide? Because you're taking an obstruent, which is the S sound, and you're combining it with a lateral liquid in which the airflow is sonorous. So obstruent with a sonorant sound. So what is better, SW or SL? SL, because SL is more complex. So the higher up the mountain you go, the more sounds you're going to improve. Yeah. But for all of this, you're overlaying on top of it, all the stuff you talked about at the beginning in terms of stimulability, right? Yeah. So if you have a child who's not stimulable for the L, no matter what you do and, and how you structure your cues, you might go with SW? Yes, exactly. That's exactly what I'd go for. Yeah, exactly. So if they can't do SL, they do SW. Do I do ST? No, because that's a fricative stop. Do I do SP, SK? No, 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 no. So I'm glad you brought up this extremely important uh, point, which is mix your obstruents with the glides. And either the glide, even better, would be the liquids, L and R. But if you can't do the L and R, go right to the W. And like you said, because practice makes perfect, practice also makes imperfect. We do not want to reward Ws for L and R. I love it. I love it. That Thank you for bringing up that really super important uh, concept in the complexity approach. This is fun. Thank you. I'm like getting my like grad school. I forgot all about sonorants and obstruents. So this is lovely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so this is all slightly above my head, but I'm, I'm learning a lot and, and I'm enjoying and appreciating a lot of this. And I wonder if in our last couple of minutes, there's anything else you'd like to tell us about selecting those treatment targets based on phonological processes. Oh, well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast. I have drool coming down my mouth. We're talking about such an important topic that changes children's brains. It is awesome. So the, what we're going to leave with is when it comes to selecting treatment targets, it's like playing poker. At the end of the day, it's just like playing poker. And what is poker? Three of a kind beats two. So three element clusters such as SPL is better than two element clusters such as SL. Higher cards, later developing sounds are better than earlier developing sounds. So the king beats the two. You don't wanna work on the P, you wanna work on the R instead because like I said, speech doesn't develop like a geyser. It always develops like a waterfall. And when I'm doing my own research, I find it doesn't even develop like a hose. If I'm working on something in speech, it's not laterally producing, it produces downward. So I always wanna go higher than what my goal is in speech. Always go higher than your goal because they always have the waterfall effect. And then I think in the last, area I want to tell you about that we didn't really discuss, but TH sound. I found TH to be a dud. Even though it's a late developing sound, TH, R blends are really late and TH is really late because it's outside of the mouth. I find that it doesn't have the impact the S blends do. So I know we didn't discuss that today, but put that in your pocket. TH, R blends are outsiders. So if we're in Las Vegas, I always think they're the street musician. They're very talented, but they just don't have influence on others. They're outsiders. They're not the Celine Dion's or the Britney Spears. Those are the S blends. So you're gonna remember. That was such a creative analogy. I was like, where is she going with this with Las Vegas? But then that makes so much sense. <laughs> it's all poker, okay? It's poker. <laughs> and you've got your Britney Spears and you have your street musicians. They're equally talented. The THR is very complex, but it's an outsider. It has, I've done research on this. It doesn't have the impact on the other sounds, that nice waterfall effect that S blends do. 
This was really, really interesting. Yeah. And I appreciate, we both appreciate mm-hmm. all of your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Amy, do you have any other final questions? No, I wanted to thank you so much. This was really, this was really fun. And it, it just makes me think of needing to go up and just go back to my, my college texts and look up the place manner voicing chart and just refresh my memory about all the relationships with the sounds to one another. Hey, well, thank you. Your podcast is awesome. Um, I just love it. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Well, no, thank you. Thank you. That was a very nice compliment that you just paid us. And we're happy to have you. For anyone who's listening, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you learned something. All of the references and um, resources that we mentioned throughout the episode will be listed in the show notes. And they're also listed on our website. So if you're listening while you're running or jogging or folding your laundry, no need to worry about having not taken notes. We've got it all down, written down for you. Kelly, thank you again so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us in today's episode. As always, you can use this episode for ASHA CEUs. You can also potentially use this episode for other credits, depending on the regulations of your governing body. To determine if this episode will count towards professional development in your area of study, please check in with your governing bodies, or you can go to our website, www.slpnerdcast.com. All of the references and information listed throughout the course of the episode will be listed in the show notes. And as always, if you have any questions, please email us at info at slpnerdcast.com. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to welcome you back here again soon.